uh, today we will have uh, three presenters. Uh, one of the presenter is going to be Maritza, our usual host. Uh, and uh, one of the presenter is going to be uh, Christopher Brooks, which uh, you know some of you may already know uh, as the um, IOGT uh, Global Coordinator. So to give us some new important updates uh, about IOGT. Uh, another presenter, which is uh, Naina Ahuja, uh, is uh, leading the global effort on what we call the remote health worker training. Uh, so that is uh, for this webinar today. Um, and uh, I would like to quickly introduce the webinars and the idea of the uh, T4D uh, knowledge sharing webinar in, uh, in this region. Uh, so this is part of our knowledge sharing and management plan, uh, which is uh, still a work in progress. Uh, and we have decided to take some sort of experimental approach. Um, the reason why we wanted to take that experimental approach is that we want to create products that are relevant for you, uh, products that are timely, uh, products that are valuable, right? And uh, with uh, these webinars, we have also created other products or taking other actions. Uh, and uh, some of these actions that are already uh, delivered uh, are the T4D newsletter, which I believe uh, most of you are receiving by now. If you are not receiving them, please send us, uh, you know, a quick note, and we will be, uh, we will make sure that you are included in the in the mailing list. Um, Another part is the T4D uh, and uh, innovation uh, ideas form. So that form will allow you to actually uh, send some of the ideas that you have uh, and share some initiatives that you have uh, that have technological components or uh, innovative components. And uh, we will use that uh, to explore the idea further with you. Uh, we also have a webinar library, uh, and in that webinar library, you can find all of our recordings of the past webinars, so you can catch up if you missed uh, one webinar. Uh, we also created a listing of interesting opportunities for learning, uh, stretch assignments, uh, and uh, you know other positions happening in the organization, but still around for the innovation uh, ICT. Uh, and uh, we have some future products uh, that uh, some of them have started, uh, like uh, the competencies match, uh, map and match exercise, right? And the idea is to list the competencies of the, you know, different T4D focal points uh, and be able to match them with interesting learning uh, opportunities and also have what we uh, like to call a matrix management proposal so that uh, we can use cross fertilization in this region. We can uh, uh, use um, sharing of competencies, sharing of ideas and, and sharing of resources. Um, and we will start soon what we call the country's deep dives, uh, where we will take maybe one week and go uh, over uh, a country and uh, assess the T4D uh, and innovation maturity, give a recommendation. Uh, so stay tuned for these kind of uh, uh, these kind of uh, actions that are upcoming. Uh, so this particular webinar is going to. Uh, someone wants to come in. OK, so this this particular webinar is going to explore, as I said earlier, uh, some IOGT updates. Uh, and present to you the experience of deploying the remote health worker training uh, in this region. Um, I have uh, just maybe one more update to make before I pass on the floor to uh, our presenter, uh, which is about the, um, uh, the webinar topics. Uh, so uh, we have lined up uh, an interesting uh, series of webinar until the end of the year. Some of these webinars are capacity building oriented uh, and are being made by uh, Winnie, which is one of our partner and uh, Rapid Pro provider. 
So Winnie is going to uh, explore with us topics like artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, and uh, you know how new technologies can be applied uh, more broadly in uh, the area of social and behavioral change. Um, so uh, we also want to hear from you. Uh, what are those webinar ideas that you want us to explore? Uh, what uh, are those experiences that you want to present? Like the last time uh, we had uh, Guatemala presenting their experience and also Costa Rica presenting the, their experience. So we want to make sure that uh, over the next uh, two years, each country presents at least once. Uh, and uh, we also have some pre-listed topics. Uh, we are going to be inviting some of the other T4D business analysts from other regions uh, to present to you some topics like digital transformation. What is it? What is it about? Um, agile. What is being agile? So we talk about agile transformation, agile project management, um, and uh, that is very important and key to digital transformation. Another very important point to digital transformation is actually change management. Uh, so what is change management? How do we conduct change management uh, in our organization, but also on a daily basis? How do we do that? Because those two points um, are very important for digital transformation. Again, agile and change management. Uh, so we will send you a form soon to ask you to submit your ideas. Uh, and prioritize the list of topics that we have for you uh, to present for the upcoming webinar. So with that, I will stop here. Uh, and I think the lineup is uh, Christopher and uh, then Naina and Maritza. Is Christopher online? Yes, I am here, Masamba. Great, great. So Chris, uh, without further ado, over to you. Great. Thank you very much, um, and, and thank you for giving me the first slot on the program here. Uh, uh, everyone, is, uh, it's good to see you all, your little bubbles on the screen here. Um, thanks so much for sharing a little bit of your time again um, on the, the regional webinar today. Uh, I had come, I think it was two months ago now, and spoke a little bit about IOGT and the platform and um, the potential that it uh, has for country offices to deploy program content in a way that bridges the digital divide. Um, we uh, there there were some follow ups that, uh, to be honest, some of them I have been able to get around to, and, and others of them I haven't. And for those of you who I, I haven't reached out to yet, uh, I apologize for the delay. Um, it's been quite a lot of work uh, resolving an issue that I'm I'm going to share the resolution um, with you on today, which is very exciting. So. When I had spoken with you last time, um, we had talked about the possibility of zero rating IOGT platforms in your country. Uh, zero rating means there is no cost or data package usage for the end user who is the mobile phone subscriber. And ideally, it also means that even if the person hasn't purchased the data package or um, uh, yeah, has never has never considered buying a data package with their mobile network operator. They would still be able to access the IOGT platform. Um, the, uh, the the challenge which we had had in the past was that we weren't able to um, assign a unique static IP address uh, for the IOGT platforms, which is how almost all mobile network operators are handling their zero rating setups. Uh, the great news now is that uh, as of uh, today, we can fully accommodate a zero rating setup for any mobile network operators that are OK with us uh, zero rating the entire IOGT network, all of the different sites across the different countries. And if you have a mobile network operator that only wants to zero rate the particular IOGT platform for your country office and for your program activities. Uh, we're also very close to a solution for that. So our vendor items um, was able to develop the, the Azure infrastructure needed to facilitate the, the zero rating access to the entire network. Um, 
actually I've, I've misspoken uh, just a little bit here. Um, if you are a new platform or if you're able to provide your MNO with a new static IP address, that's actually something that we can accommodate today uh, is having a single static IP address that would zero rate just your individual offices platform. Um, for country offices that were on IOGT version one and that need to retain their static IP address, uh, if you're in that category, as I know Ecuador is, and I believe Ecuador is the only um, uh, country within this region, but uh, it, it has been um, kind of an, an outstanding process, ICTD, needs to actually do that work of moving the IP address from the the old version of IOGT in that Azure environment to the new version and our new environment. Um, but they actually uh, were able to confirm um, it was yesterday morning that they are able to support on that. Um, and over the next couple of weeks, we should start being able to um, transition platforms that were on the version one of the IOGT and bring those static IP addresses that they used for zero rating over to the version two environment. So for anyone um, who doesn't have an MNO relationship or IOGT yet, uh, the great news is that today we could um, give you all the assets you need to uh, negotiate that with a, an MNO and get zero rated access to IOGT for your uh, users or participants. And, um, and for Ecuador, uh, I, I don't know if everyone is on this call, but if someone from the, the country office is on this call, uh, we'll have a resolution soon where we can bring over that uh, old static IP from IOGT version one. And I'm, I'm going to keep it uh, somewhat short and sweet. And uh, Masamba, I saw your hand is raised. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And uh, for the um, you know people in this call who don't know about IOGT, if you can take just uh, 30 seconds uh, explaining what IOGT is, uh, and also for uh, our program colleagues, um, what will be the impact of the zero rating? What will it mean uh, programmatically? Over. Great, excellent questions, Masamba. Thank you for grounding me in uh, in the kind of the variety of people that we have on the call today. For people that that don't know. IOGT is a data light website um, that you can deploy uh, for your country office and publish content around your programmatic interventions or other things that um, that could benefit from a, a website experience. Uh, it's designed to be um, to, to kind of have many aspects of what are the technical requirements to bridge what we call the digital divide, which means the difference between those of us who can easily access the internet through our advanced devices and and strong network connections and for many of our program participants who uh, maybe can't afford to purchase a data package at all or maybe they have a very um, simple feature phone that has a web browser but because almost all websites today use advanced technologies to to develop their websites uh, their feature phone doesn't work well on those platforms. Um, you know, they they may also be in an area where their network connection is very slow and it takes a long, long time to access a site which has a lot of um, rich image or video content, which automatically um, is loaded by the device. IOGT is designed to uh, deal with all those scenarios. Um, it looks very good on a uh, computer or on a smartphone, but also on a feature phone. Uh, we minimize the amount of data that we're passing back and forth between the user and the server, which means that things load faster. And it also means that uh, if you do, for example, have an MNO partnership, that there's less of a, um, a requirement for the MNO to, to deal with the data that they're uh, providing for free. So at its heart, the goal is to help make um, UNICEF's programmatic interventions easier to access by um, people who have lesser ability to access the internet and uh, you know that that includes tech reasons but also accessibility reasons um, one of the really important aspects of this is zero rating i was looking at um, a bunch of statistics today from gsma 
Uh, and although we have a tremendous amount of mobile network coverage um, in the different regions around the world, we have also a large gulf of people who, um, although they're covered by an internet uh, signal, are not subscribing in any way to uh, internet um, uh, access for their their devices. Um, and IOGT helps bridge that significant gap by, in this case, providing the ability to zero rate with an MNO partner. So your MNO partner, you may approach them and explain the value of what UNICEF is doing, explain the value of what IOGT brings to the table, which is that uh, it can help UNICEF deliver the digital interventions in a way that is less impactful and, and is more accessible. Um, and then if the, IO, uh, the MNO agrees to zero rate your traffic to users, it means that um, there won't be any cost for the users to use the IOGT platform and to interact and engage with your programmatic content. Uh, and so it's, it's, a, it's a very meaningful way to open the access to a much broader part of the population than is possible if people had to pay for it. And uh, if, if there are any questions about IOGT or about zero rating, I'm I'm happy to uh, to answer them. Uh, Asim Osama said we can ask some questions. Uh, please feel free to raise your hands or yeah, turn on your mic or even um, just leave it in the comments. Uh, but uh, actually, you know what I'll do? I, right now I'm going to put in the comments a link to our uh, what's called our global site for the Internet of Good Things. Um, which is a place where you can go and see uh, some of the content that we've created around different programmatic areas that UNICEF focuses on. You can see what the interface looks like and, and you can get an idea of uh, also the fact that it is a, a simple and modern and clean uh, a kind of interface that people who are new to digital experiences will have an easy time navigating. That's another thing we focus on is people with lower levels of digital, digital literacy. How do we um, also invite them into this experience and make sure that they can engage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christopher. That's uh, that's very informative. Uh, and uh, colleagues who are already deploying IOGT, feel free to uh, contact uh, Christopher uh, and us if you wish uh, to have any support. Um, so taking maybe a few minutes now to uh, ask any questions if you have. So I guess uh, everything was clear. Feel free to drop uh, any question in the chat. Um, so moving on, uh, Naina, I, uh, I'm looking at you. Um, so uh, Naina, please uh, go ahead. And uh, uh, Maritza will be presenting jointly with Naina. So uh, uh, most of you already know Maritza. And I think Maritza is going to do the presentation in Spanish. Uh, because we are in this region, so we have to speak some Spanish. Over. <laughs> Thanks, Masamba, for for introducing and hello, everyone. Um, I think Maritza will share her screen and then I will begin. No, we can see your screen now, Maritza. Uh, yeah, Nain, I'm sharing. Can you see my screen now? Yes, but we see your teams if you want to open the... Perfect. Yeah, Excellent. great. So sorry, my computer was pressed. <laughs> but now it's working. Great, thank you. So, so as Masamba said, my name is Nina Ahuja and I work on the Digital Health and Information Systems Unit at HQ, which sits in the health section in the program division. And I have been leading this initiative, the Remote Frontline Health Worker Training Initiative from uh, the HQ from, for almost two years now. Next slide, please. So just to give you an idea of, of what the agenda is for today, so I'll begin by giving an introduction about this initiative. Um, I'll be demoing our content repository, going over what digital channels we work with. Then I will focus on the deployment steps and what implementation looks like. 
and I'll share some lessons learned from previous deployments that we have done. And then I'll hand it over to Maritza, who will focus on the, the updates from the region and what we have been doing with, with some of the countries in the region thus far. Great. So I just want to set the scene here of how we began this work. We started this work in 2020 when the coronavirus was rampantly spreading across the world. And we were faced with this challenge. We knew it was very important for health workers to stay safe and serve their communities. They had to do so by understanding the health protocols for preventing the spread of COVID-19. At the start of the pandemic and till now, country health systems are still very much grappling with the challenge of how to keep their health workers informed of the changing dynamics of the COVID-19 response while ensuring that continuation of essential services such as routine Im immunizations continues at full capacity. So when we began in 2020, we, we engaged with some partners and began exploring the opportunities of how we can strengthen the learning systems for frontline health workers who are responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. Traditional in-person education is challenging and then in some situations not feasible due to the COVID-19 context. But it's still essential for the ministries of health and implementers to ensure that frontline health workers have the knowledge and skills needed to continue to provide preventative, promotive, and curative services, to conduct risk communication and community engagement, and to support community-based surveillance while being able to protect themselves from COVID. Conversely, frontline health workers also pass critical information to health facility staff district and national level health managers to enable them to make decisions that lead to a suitable, timely and coordinated response. So given this context, digital solutions seem to be the perfect answer to, to our problems. Next slide, please. So back, in, back at the beginning of the pandemic, there are multiple organizations who, who made available or developed relevant digital training resources to train frontline health workers directly involved in patient care to address the spread of COVID-19. You'll see on the right side of the screen, I've mentioned some of these organizations, notably WHO, CDC, NIH, and um, with a particular focus on the COVID-19 digital classroom. The COVID-19 Digital Classroom is developed by the Community Health Academy and a consortium of partners. And these partners are, are international organizations that had the expertise that we needed on how to slow down the spread of COVID-19. Another, another big group was the Stanford Digital Medic Group that sits in the Stanford Center of Health Education who also supported a lot of the Digital Classroom content and OpenWHO which is an app that's that's been created by WHO that makes available training resources on all topics, including the COVID-19 pandemic. So our digital health team at HQ leveraged these existing openly licensed training content packages, and we created an online content repository of nine different courses. These courses are ready to deploy on low bandwidth digital channels. And it's available in, in six additional languages beyond English, including Spanish, French, Portuguese, um, which are all languages that we can find in the, in the LACRA region. So as I said, that our team, we're not the content experts, but we're the digital experts. So we have leveraged these trainings that have already been created. Additionally, we have expertise on taking content that sits at the country level that is paper-based and we can digitize training packages that can be deployed on, on digital channels. Next slide, please. So I'd like to just give you a, an example of what the content looks like and the flexibility of the content with one of the courses. So our ninth course is the COVID-19 vaccine training. So this course has six different modules built into it. The first module is a general introduction to the COVID-19 vaccine. Here we list out what vaccines exist for COVID-19 and how they work. 
at a very basic level. If we're working with community health workers, we keep the content very, very simple. If we're working with higher level health workers who have more of a health background and, and um, higher literacy, we can make this adjust this um, content to be at a little bit of a higher level, so it's not extremely basic. The vaccines that are included in this section will be specific to what vaccines are available in, in the country that we are deploying. So we take some time to make sure that the content is applicable to the country and is adjusted for the area that we are deploying. Then we have a couple of modules on generating demand, RCCE, community engagement, handling vaccine hesitancy and misinformation. And then we transition to two modules around administering the vaccine and then monitoring for any adverse events following immunizations or otherwise known as AEFIs. Now these two modules are, are very specific to, to administering the vaccine, but we may be working with health workers who are not actually administering the vaccine. So to demonstrate the flexibility of this content, we can take those modules out um, and, and, and keep the remaining modules to ensure that we are targeting the health workers with information that's pertinent to their role. The last module of this course is ties in the importance of routine immunizations and the COVID-19 vaccine. So we know that during the pandemic, routine immunizations have dropped. So we've focused um, the last module on tying together the principles for immunization services and how um, immunizations can continue while, while we are still living in this COVID world. Next slide, please. Maritza, if you can play the video, perfect. So this is our online content repository that uh, we will share the link uh, at the end of this presentation so you can go directly to it. But here is where our content sits. It's on a website called Compass, which is hosted by John Hopkins University. It's very simple and easy to navigate. We give a quick introduction about what this content is. And then when you click view resource, you're taken to the actual content of the nine different courses. It's available for anyone to access, not just UNICEF country offices, but beyond UNICEF as well. I'm not sure if it's sort of flashing. I don't know if that's for me or from your end, Maritza, but on the front page, we show the, the nine different courses and you'll see that there's a quiz available with each of the courses. So it just lists out their names and the, and the quizzes. Um, if you're interested in a specific course, then you can click on the course name and it'll take you directly to the course. When you get to the home page of the course, you'll see the different modules and sub modules within each course so you know what content is covered. If you're interested in a specific module, you can directly navigate there and you'll see that the course content is available there. Note that there's multimedia integrated depending on the platform of choice. So if using a platform that allows for multimedia, there will be images and videos that are also included with the written course content. As I said, there's a quiz associated with each course. It's delivered in a pre post format. So the quiz will be completed before the health workers start the training and then after so we can see what change in knowledge has occurred due to the training content. Next slide, please, Maritza. OK, so now to speak about the digital channels. So as I mentioned briefly at the beginning, we have prepared all of this content for low bandwidth digital channels, meaning that you don't need a fancy device. You don't need stable, strong Internet connection. The idea is that we're trying to reach the last mile with this pertinent information, no matter what context they're in. So because of that, we're platform agnostic. We don't have any one platform, 
but have made this content available on multiple platforms. Some examples of this include an SMS chatbot, Telegram, IOGT, which Chris was just talking about, Moodle, which is a learning management system, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, Viber, all of these channels are available for us to deploy the training content on. SMS is the only platform that the multimedia would not be included. The other platforms allow for multimedia to be integrated. Next slide, Maritza. So now I'll transition to talking about the implementation. So there's five steps in, towards implementing this work, and I will go through all of them next. So go ahead to the next slide, Maritza. So the first step is the course selection and content review step. So I meant, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have these nine courses available. You have the, each country has the opportunity to select which course or courses they're interested in. So if you're interested in all nine courses, we can deploy all nine. If you're only interested in a few, we can deploy a few. It's totally left up to the country's interest and needs. Once the course has been selected from there, we go through a heavy content review process. This is probably the most time consuming process of deployment because it's essential that we review the course content for the level of appropriateness and sensitivity. Maritza, can you hit the, thank you. So when I'm talking about the level of appropriateness and sensitivity, what I mean by that is we want the, the country to review with, in partnership with the MOH or any implementing partner, we want them to review each message to assess the level of appropriateness based on the role of the target audience. So as I gave the example um, early on in the presentation, if we're working with health workers who are not administering the COVID-19 vaccine, we would need to know that so we can remove the modules about that. So the health workers are not receiving information that would that is not applicable to their to their role. Additionally, we want to assess the sensitivity based on the situation and any potential interpretations and language needs. So as I said, it is translated into Spanish, Portuguese and French, but if there are any adjustments that need to be made, um, all that will be need to be taken into consideration. At this point, we also are open to receiving any comments from the country office or any content that needs to be added to our course content. The courses that we have developed serve as a starting point and by no means are we forcing that it should only be this uh, we are very flexible to adjusting um, and taking out or adding depending on the country's need next slide then the next step is the content localization so based on the feedback from the country office review our team at hq will localize the course workflows once we have gone through that process, we will send the localized course content back to the country and whoever validated the content in the first step, whether that's the country office and the MOH or the country office and an implementing partner, um, will have them review it one more time to ensure that the course content looks exactly as how they had envisioned and we've integrated all their comments as they expected. Next step. So the next step is the is the digitization process. So here, once we have the course course workflows finalized at the end of step two, we then put it on the digital platform of choice. So the very first step is to identify the digital channel or channels that would be used in in the country for deployment. So we are not um, limited to just one channel. We can we can deploy on on multiple channels depending on the context in the country. And here is where Maritza begins her support and helps us transition the content onto the appropriate digital channel. She helps support us with configuring the platforms and getting the content ready and doing the testing, etc. Next slide, please. After we have digitized the content, Maritza has done some testing. I've done some testing. We are ready to begin the new the next step of the health worker user validation process. So here with a small sample of health workers, we ask that we enroll a few of them in the 
courses on the digital platform and take them through the learning process. We aim to gather feedback on their experience so we can adjust anything that needs to be adjusted before we are we are deploying with a large large group of people. So if you can click and thank you. So we're trying to gather feedback on one, the user friendliness of the learning platform. So it's essential that we get the health workers actually engaging with the content on the digital channel to make sure that they're able to navigate, they're able to use it, the channel is working as expected. We also would like to gather feedback on the levels of the user engagement. So are health workers actually enjoying the content? Are they able to understand the content and review everything? Um, and are they actually taking away any learnings? And then the last piece is the knowledge evaluation, which I mentioned previously around the pre-test and post-test, and to see that if there are any changes in knowledge. Once we gather all that feedback, we will then integrate and, and move on to the next step, which is, go ahead, Maritza, which is deploying the training with frontline health workers at scale. So that's the last final step. Um, and then again, we would still be doing that monitoring and evaluation um, that I mentioned in the previous step. We have a, an m and &E framework created with, which has a list of indicators for the three different buckets. Um, and, and we would expect to, to gather some feedback on that. Most of that is built in already um, due to the digital platforms. So for example, Rapid Pro powers SMS, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, uh, Telegram, and the Rapid Pro backend provides us a lot of the m &E indicators that we're looking for. So it's not an extra, it's not an extra, you know, work, but but already built into the deployment. Next slide, Maritza. Thank you. So here I would like to sh share some lessons that that we have learned from previous deployments. So we. We started this work in the Wakaro region back in 2020 and worked with four different countries there, um, Liberia, Chad, DRC, and Togo. From those deployments, we got some great lessons learned. First, we found a couple of steps that was you know, important to include. One is to, to present it to the Ministry of Health for their buy-in. Um, it, it, having the ministry involved just helps with success of the deployment, but of course it's not necessary. The second important lesson we learned is about the importance of reviewing the content and adapting it to the context. So that is why the very first step um, was added as part of the implementation process to ensure that we get the content ready for the context it's being delivered in. Next, it's important to develop a rollout plan so having an idea of how this content will actually reach the health workers and what targets we have will obviously help with the uptake of the content. And then of course, important to remember to engage with us at HQ with support and Maritza at RO who provides a lot of support on getting this, this content on the ground. As for the digital channels, the tool and platform selection can be are based on, on, on two important things. So first, if there's availability of smartphones. If there is availability of smartphones, the options of what channels we can use to deploy this content widens. But if we're only working with simple phones and the country has a Rapid Pro instance, SMS is the option to go for. In terms of feedback that we received from community health workers in these four regions of which platform was preferred, Moodle emerged as the favorite option, followed by Telegram. The health workers really enjoyed the Moodle platform, felt it kept them engaged, they were able to review the content easily, um, and, and they were able to view all the multimedia, the videos and pictures that I mentioned, which they weren't able to do on, on SMS. Telegram is a very similar interface as WhatsApp. They're, they're sort of sisters, um, and Telegram is it has the same uh, features that Moodle does. The only you know, negative about Moodle is often health workers haven't used the platform before, so there is a learning curve to learn and familiarize yourself with the platform before engaging with the training content. Telegram, 
that learning curve is completely knocked out because most folks have worked with WhatsApp or Telegram before, so they're already familiar with the platform. Next slide, Maritza. So here I'm going to list, I have listed out some key documents and resources that are available. The first is a link to the content repository, the video that was demoed that shows all of the actual course content. The second is a link to a course catalog. So as you probably saw, there's a lot of content, so it can be a bit overwhelming. Hence, we developed this course catalog. It lists out all the nine courses, their titles, uh, their learning objectives, and a very quick summary. We generally advise using the course catalog at the beginning to help inform the course selection process. The third is a link to a country engagement plan. This country engagement plan is um, goes into a, a lot more detail of what I have shared today on in terms of the implementation. Often we find the, the people that we're working with haven't implemented trainings for health workers on digital platforms before. So it gives you a good introduction to the basics and then helps helps define the implementation steps with more detail. And last is a guidance. It's a Microsoft Sway guidance that we've developed at HQ on the steps for deploying a health worker digital learning program. So I'll stop here. Um, Maritza, if you click again, I have my email address. Thank you. So at the bottom, you'll see you'll find my email address. Um, you can reach out to us on our unit email address or directly reach out to me. Um, you'll probably get a little bit of a faster response if you reach out directly to me. And if you're interested in this content, we can we can begin to work together. So I'll hand it over to Maritza to speak about the experiences that we've had in LACRO thus far. Thank you, Nana. Nana, can you hear me? Oh. Can you hear yes. me? Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> My yes. computer. Yeah, no. Thank you, Nana, for uh, your uh, introduction about remote health worker training. And Masamba say, I will start now speaking in Spanish to, to show the people uh, the LACRO like country's status. Uh, gracias, colegas. Gracias a todos. Y, uh, bueno. Antes que nada, que antes de empezar a, a, a contarles el estado o el progreso en el que estamos en esta iniciativa de, de, remor, eh, de um, entrenamientos pa, en COVID-19 para trabajadores de la salud, quiero contarles que desde la Creative 4 d hemos brindado un soporte eh, bastante eh, persuasivo y fuerte con los, con los países de la región. Desde el año pasado iniciamos las conversaciones y empezamos incluyéndonos en uh, diferentes webinars eh, con Neina explicando el proyecto y nosotros dando, brindando todo el soporte. En esta presentación ustedes pueden ver estas dos, eh, digamos que dos columnas, dos pantallas. En la primera eh, están los países en los que empezamos esas comunicaciones, les enviamos los mensajes y se mostraron inicialmente interesados en esta iniciativa que ofrecía salud digital desde la sede de Nueva York. Eh, de esos países, nosotros estamos trabajando la implementación con Honduras, Paraguay y Venezuela. Estos países se han venido, eh, con estos países hemos venido trabajando. Eh, inicialmente eh, voy a presentarles acá el estatus de Honduras. De Honduras. Um, creo que en la llamada está el colega uh, José, que hemos trabajado fuertemente con él. Eh, bueno, para iniciar, para desarrollar y desplegar los cursos en Honduras, inicialmente se, se tiene un target de trabajadores de la salud de 500 a 600. Entonces, lo ideal es desplegar los cursos a estos trabajadores de la salud. En este momento estamos en la validación de usuarios. ¿Qué consiste esta validación? Como mencionaba Neina, en esta validación de usuarios, nosotros eh, aquí tengo un pequeñito video, voy a mostrarles más o menos cómo eh, se, se puede visualizar um, los, los cursos a través de WhatsApp, que va a ser el despliegue de de cursos eh, de Honduras. Entonces, en esta validación de usuarios, aquí eh, tenemos que 
los, eh, se ha elegido un grupo de 30 a 50 trabajadores de la salud de Honduras y ellos han ayudado a mejorar la herramienta. Entonces nosotros les generamos todo este flujo por WhatsApp, se lo enviamos a ellos y ellos empiezan a interactuar con el sistema. La idea de esta validación de usuarios es que ellos hagan, eh, nos den ese feedback, esos comentarios, tanto en cuanto a los contenidos como en la navegabilidad del sistema. Entonces, bueno, eh, de los cursos que Honduras ha decidido desplegar, eh, es, está el curso 2, que es acerca de prevención y protección, el curso 3, que es salud mental, entonces el curso 6, el curso 7 y el curso 8, como pueden ver en esta presentación. Entonces, um, en el, eh, para llegar a este paso, nosotros ya eh, tuvimos eh, la revisión de los contenidos, los colegas de la oficina de Honduras han incluido sus comentarios, se han hecho ajustes a los contenidos de los cursos. Ah, es importante mencionar que ellos están trabajando con un partner eh, en Honduras y en la región de Cortés de ese país. Entonces, aquí como ustedes pueden ver, ya tenemos, digamos, estamos en este proceso de, de los espacios que, de, eh, que menciona Neina. Iríamos en el paso número 5, que es esa validación de, usar, de usuarios. Eh, dentro de la dinámica que tiene Honduras, cada, uh, se está validando dos cursos por sesión. Ahora vamos a tener nuestra última sesión este sábado y continuaremos ya con el despliegue de los cursos en las próximas semanas. Eh, Adicionalmente, tenemos, como les mencionaba, Venezuela. Con Venezuela, eh, el despliegue de cursos, voy aquí presentando el video, lo haremos a través de Moodle. Esta plataforma se ha elegido Moodle porque eh, ellos, eh, antes de, de elegir, eh, digamos, eh, la herramienta o el canal en que se vayan a desplegar los cursos, necesitamos contar con diferentes, eh, digamos, como... Uh, diferentes sistemas como es Rapid Pro para desplegar, eh, eh, para desplegar en canales tales como Telegram, What, eh, Telegram WhatsApp eh, y otros canales que, se, que necesita esta herramienta, ¿verdad? Entonces, bueno, en, en términos generales, eh, Venezuela vamos a desplegar de 600, va, eh, digamos que nuestro scope de usuarios es de 600 a 1,000 usuarios. Eh, ellos hacen parte, eh, bueno, Venezuela también tiene un partner con el que trabaja. Ellos son Finampime y Redi Salud. Ellos trabajan con el equipo de salud de Venezuela. En este momento estamos, eh, digamos que en los últimos ajustes de esta herramienta de Moodle que les estoy presentando aquí. Eh, entonces, eh, estamos mejorando la navegabilidad. Ah, quiero contarles un poco acerca de esto. Eh, bueno, aquí ustedes pueden ver. Eh, está, ponemos todos los contenidos, se describe, eh, el, aquí estamos presentando el curso número uno. Um, otra de las características que tiene este sistema de módulo es que los trabajadores de la salud se pueden matricular ellos, eh, hacer una autoinscripción, es una gran herramienta también. Eh, bueno, en cuanto a los cursos que, está, que quiere desplegar eh, Venezuela, ellos han elegido tres cursos, el curso número 2, el curso número 8. Como bien mencionaba en un inicio, Neina, eh, hay un catálogo de nueve cursos que ofrece salud digital, ¿verdad? Pero cada país es libre de elegir qué cursos eh, de, quiere, uh, quiere utilizar o quiere desplegar de acuerdo a las necesidades de su país o para... Eh, sí, o para mm, soportar esto del eh, dar soporte con estos entrenamientos para el COVID-19. Eh, bueno, aquí también quiero mencionar, eh, hay unos nuevos tópicos o unos nuevos temas que tiene Venezuela y lo ideal es que una vez hayamos desplegado estos cursos, les apoyemos desde Salud Digital y desde la t 4 d a digitalizar esos contenidos en esta plataforma Moodle. Entonces, son... Eh, son estos tres contenidos que ustedes ven al final de la, de la, de la tabla. Eh, la idea es eh, apoyarlos con, con la digitalización de esos cursos. Bueno, eh, en Paraguay, ¿cómo vamos con Paraguay? Eh, también se pretende, el, los usuarios son de 500 a 600 usuarios, se, se, se espera llegar a, a ese grupo. En el estatus, nosotros en este momento estamos finalizando los flujos, 
eh, de acuerdo a los comentarios y a, la, eh, a, sí, a los comentarios que surgieron en la revisión de los contenidos y empezamos y también el, el, desde la oficina están empezando con toda la divulgación de los cursos eh, a partir de, eh, de campañas sociales. Eh, a partir de las eh, redes sociales o la divulgación de los contenidos y el, el identificar qué grupo de trabajadores de la salud vamos a desplegar estos cursos. Eh, para Paraguay, ellos desean el eh, despliegue de cursos a través de, eh, han elegido seis, eh, cuatro cursos, disculpen, el curso número seis, el curso número siete y el curso número nueve. Eh, est, ellos quieren desplegar también la, estamos trabajando para la configuración a través de WhatsApp de, de estos cursos. Entonces, como bien ustedes pueden ver también con la experiencia del, eh, de, de Honduras que les mostraba hace un ratito, va a ser también a través de WhatsApp. Entonces, va, eh, luego que terminemos de configurar, vamos a, a pasar a la validación de usuarios, donde eh, podemos incluir o mejorar ciertas, eh, ciertas necesidades, pero ya desde la postura de Paraguay. Entonces, ese es básicamente nuestro estatus, el estatus, en sí, el progreso en el que vamos en este momento con estos tres países. Cabe resaltar que, oh, un segundo, por favor, cabe resaltar que, eh, que eh, en este momento nosotros empezamos, continuamos con estos tres países y eh, nosotros los abordamos en una fase número uno. Estamos también comunicándonos con oficinas como Brasil eh, y oficinas que les puedan estar muy interesadas en este despliegue de cursos. Ya tenemos la experiencia de estos tres países, eh, de la implementación de estos tres países en la región. Nosotras con, eh, desde, desde la sede eh, eh, de, con Neina y desde la Creative for D eh, brindamos todo el apoyo para el despliegue de estos cursos, nosotras eh, les ofrecemos las eh, reuniones iniciales para que conozcan acerca de estos cursos entonces eh, esta experiencia que nos ha llevado a estos tres países podemos seguirla mejorando y, y, y adaptando para, la, para poder atraer otros países de la región porque es, eh, digamos que esta iniciativa y este proyecto vale la pena ser utilizado en otros países y poder ser adaptado eh, desde otros canales. Entonces, bueno, básicamente de este proceso, en el proceso en el que vamos con eh, Paraguay, Honduras y Venezuela, nos ha traído ciertas conclusiones. Eh, una de ellas es desarrollos iniciales de los planes de trabajo y comprometerse a cumplirlos teniendo en cuenta toda esta serie de pasos y que involucra a ciertos agentes como el Ministerio de Educación, tal como lo mencionó Neina. Mm, otra cosa es desde el equipo, uh, desde el equipo de T4D, nosotros estamos siempre, siempre, eh, digamos que, eh, pendientes, informándoles o mejorando y ajustando siempre esos procesos para desde nuestro soporte tener la completa, eh, la completa seguridad de poder brindar soporte y solución acerca de las herramientas que les elijan para estos despliegues. Entonces, estas planificaciones son tan importantes como para la, el ajuste de contenidos, como para el desarrollo y el análisis, eh, no análisis, sino el desarrollo y el ajuste de esas herramientas para desplegar los cursos. Entonces, bueno, ahora en cuanto a las plataformas, una de las experiencias es que eh, hasta el momento es que es importante antes de, eh, de elegir el canal en el cual se desea implementar, eh, desplegar los cursos, mmm, que haya una, eh, mmm, digamos que una revisión de lo que se tiene. Por ejemplo, como les decía anteriormente, si los países quieren desplegar los contenidos a través de WhatsApp, a través de Telegram, SMS, uh, eh, necesitamos antes contar con la, contar con el, la herramienta y el soporte de Rapid Pro. Eh, ¿Por qué? Porque es a través de esos flujos y a través de ese sistema que nosotros generamos toda esa interacción de esos canales. Ahora, si los países no cuentan, tenemos otras soluciones como Moodle. Entonces, es, es, esa es una de las experiencias que ha dejado, que ha dejado hasta el momento el trabajar con estos tres países y la experiencia que nos ha dejado en la región de, de Lacro. Básicamente, esa es toda la actualización del estatus, el progreso en nuestra región. 
Mm, antes de finalizar, me gustaría animarlas y animarlos a que si ustedes consideran estos contenidos de los, los contenidos de los cursos puedan ser de interés para sus países porque, bueno, en esta llamada se ha convocado a colegas de, la área, de áreas de la salud, de programas, también los colegas de T4D, que ustedes identifiquen que en sus países eh, sea, sea estas, este tipo de, de uh, este proyecto, esta iniciativa que, ofrece de, que, que ofrecen los colegas de HQ y, en, y con nuestro soporte, y ustedes consideran válidos, por favor, contáctense con nosotros. Eh, yo soy la punta focal de la región, Neina es líder de, de los contenidos, ustedes pueden contactarse con nosotras y nosotras inmediatamente comenzaremos a apoyarlos y a orientarles en el desarrollo de esta de esta iniciativa y esta propuesta. Eh, por mi parte, aquí termina mi, mi actualización. Muchas gracias. Eh, Nosamba, eh, I'm finished thank my presentation. You. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Maritza. I think uh, uh, this was uh, this was well done. Uh, thank you so much, uh, and thanks to thanks to Nena. Uh, so uh, I think we are five minutes over time, but uh, I hope uh, this was uh, as interesting for you uh, as it was for us. Uh, and uh, maybe let's take a couple of minutes to give a chance to uh, our colleagues if they have any burning questions they want to ask. As Maritza said, we are available if you need uh, any support or if you have any questions. So uh, do you have questions for the presenters? Oh. Maybe I can kick us off by uh, answering Lillian's question in the chat and then I can, we can mm -hmm. open the floor. Yes, please. Uh, so Lillian, can, I, Lillian, can, I can I respond? Sorry, Nina. <laughs> can I respond the Lillian question? I will respond in Spanish. So I, sorry, sorry. First, first I send uh, just to Nina my uh, first question, and you can see my second question, uh, Marisa. The first question was directly to Nina. Please, Nina. Thank you. Thanks, Lillian. Um, I, I'll respond first, Maritza, and then, and then you can respond to the second question. Uh, so great question, Lillian. Um, the content is aimed for health workers specifically. It's, it is to help health workers better, better do their job um, within the community. However, the content is uh, on COVID-19 and the basic facts about COVID-19 are, are similar across all populations. For example, information about prevention of COVID-19 to wear masks, socially distance, get vaccinated. You know, that's the same for everyone. So it can be adapted for, for a different audience such as young people, but it will be much more of a heavy lift to adapt it. It's a lot more work. It, it, when it was created, it was originally created for health workers specifically. Is that help answer your question? Yes, thank you. Right. Over to you, Maritza. Great, thank you, Nina. Uh, I want to respond to the last question from Lillian. Uh, the, uh, if useful to make different calls with Rapid Pro and Moodle. In Lily, it's different because um, if you decide to, for instance, deploy the content of courses in Paraguay, will be by WhatsApp, right? But uh, you, you already, the Paraguay country office already have Rapid Pro, so I think it's, it's, it's um, expensive enough. It is more cheaper if we continue to deploy using Rapid Pro because the WENI. Uh, give us all support with this kind of integration. But uh, for instance, if the case, uh, if any country that doesn't have any Rapid Pro vendor is a good is is an op a good option to deploy content of courses uh, using Moodle. But in the case to the country that already have R Rapid Pro vendor, I think it's a good idea. I think in the uh, this channel like uh, Nina mentioned, uh, Telegram, WhatsApp, SMS. I don't know if I respond to your question. Uh, 
uh, uh, yes, Maritza, but the the mother that is uh, what the cause of Moodle because I was looking your presentation and the uh, Moodle uh, is better interface than WhatsApp interface. Just uh, for 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 that issue, I, I was a uh, request. Yeah, Lily, uh, Moodle Cloud costs one one thousand no one yeah one thousand four hundred dollars per year. Moodle Cloud. It, it, it's fifteen hundred. Fifteen hundred. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, so Lillian, the cost for Moodle is, is very very minimal. Um, it there's a couple different options. What we found for countries that we've worked with that are using Moodle, the best option is the annual subscription that's $1,500. But Moodle has many different options, so we would spend the time to assess that with the country of if that is the right option for their scenario or if there's a, a, a different option. Uh, all the platforms are pretty pretty low cost. Um, the only time where it gets expensive is, is if, you know, building a Rapid Pro instance from the ground. Um, but if countries have a rapid pro instance, it makes it a lot easier. Um, and, and depending on, on SMS, depending on, you know, what mobile network operator partnerships there may be, um, you know, we can get that free costed SMS messages. So it, it depends. We have a costing section in the country engagement plan to, to cover all of this. And then, of course, when we consult with countries, we would talk it through as well. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Now, Yes, so it's it's not a question. It's it's more of a, a contribution. Um, so, Rapid Pro, uh, as Nena said, is um, can be quite expensive if you're deploying it for the first time. Uh, but to recall that uh, Rapid Pro is used for a lot of initiatives based on. Uh, you know, social and behavioral change like you report. Uh, and uh, where in Moodle, if you are limited to 1,000, 2,000 users, depending on the on the deployment, that cost 1,500 uh, US dollar a year. In Rapid Pro, uh, you virtually have no limits. You can reach millions of people, right? We have examples of countries that are reaching millions of people uh, through Rapid Pro, uh, and uh, for for those people that are interested in polling, right? Uh, I would like to remind you how Rapid Pro solves some of the polling questions. So, for example, um, usually when you poll uh, population, uh, you cannot reach all of the population, and you have to do sampling, right? Uh, for the statisticians among us. Uh, but Rapid Pro basically solved that issue because Rapid Pro allows you uh, to reach, uh, you know, sometimes uh, a very significant part of the population, uh, if not the entire population, depending on, uh, you know, who you are polling and, and what you are polling for. So uh, they have unique advantages. They have comparative advantages uh, that uh, you can leverage. And um, uh, Moodle sometimes may be your best option. Uh, and Moodle is a learning management system. Uh, but Rapid Pro, the way I would like uh, people to see Rapid Pro is Rapid Pro is a communication platform. So Rapid Pro can link can link to other communication platforms like IOGT, for instance, right? One of the IOGT updates is that uh, we can use IOGT to poll uh, through Rapid Pro. Uh, so um, please uh, get in touch with uh, Naina, Maritza. They will explain to you the different uh, comparative advantages and help you choose the best uh, digital solution for, uh, for your use case. And then remember, you can use many of them, you can use one of them. Over. Thank you, Masamba, for your contribution. And um, I don't know if anyone has other questions, other comments. So I see the contribution from Chris. Uh, maybe Chris, you want to touch upon that quickly, and uh, mm -hmm. then we can we can close uh, because we are at time. 
Sure, I'll, I'll just speak very quickly about it. If anyone's interested in reading the paper, we used uh, a statistical tool called the equity tool, which breaks down the uh, DHS survey and some other surveys like Mix into a couple short questions that you can ask someone via SMS or another text message platform to get a very close idea of what wealth quintile they fit into um, within the context of a country. And the, what we did for uh, your report was we we worked in a few different countries and we um, we assessed our you reporters, how well and equitably do they represent the wealth distribution in the country? So you'll see some interesting data there about um, the kind of the difference in wealth between different um, messaging channels um, and also uh, a technique for getting closer to equitable poll polling uh, on a platform like Rapid Pro. But if you're interested, read more there. And if you have any questions, um, please feel free to reach out to me or any of the other authors on that paper. Thank you. That's uh, that's great. Um, so uh, thank you so much, Nena, uh, Maritza, and and Chris. Uh, this this was very informative. Uh, please, colleagues, uh, stay tuned. We have, I think, uh, two webinars uh, in June. If I'm not mistaken, Maritza, correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. Um, yes one it. webinar will be with uh, Wenny. Uh, a capacity building webinar and the other one is going to be a knowledge sharing uh, webinar uh, and uh, the topic is still open. Uh, we will send that form to help you choose our next topic. Uh, so with that said, thank you again Nena, thank you Maritza and thank you Chris. Uh, see you soon.